um, who has been a champion and advocate of uh, sexual health services and women health services um, essentially forever. He was the first person to lead an integrated sexual health service in the UK. He was one of the lead campaigners to change the cervical cancer vaccination from Cervix to Gardasil. He's currently a consultant in the West Country and last year was awarded the Honorary Fellowship of BASH. So he's going to speak to us today about the menopause. So welcome to Peter. Jane, thank you very much indeed. It's a great pleasure to be here to stimulate you and entertain you on this rather important subject. Can I have the first slide, please? Ready to roll? Let's go. Ah, technical glitch. Fine. Never mind. Oh, well, uh, while, we're, while we're waiting, um, just to say that, uh, I mean, most of you will have your own ideas about HRT, largely given to you by the MHRA, thanks to a disastrous piece of research that was produced um, in 2002. And ever since that research came out, it has been reassessed and reassessed and reassessed. And the original assumptions of that research have been shown to be completely and utterly false. So almost completely and utterly false. So that um, almost everything you've been told by the MHRA up until 2015 has been wrong. So uh, let's uh, start taking care of menopausal women. And the idea is to understand uh, the menopausal or the perimenopausal transition and put the risk into perspective and in fact the most important uh, important message and if you, if, if you want to go to sleep right now the most important message here is that the benefits are many and the risks are very very few far less than have been uh, have been uh, promoted and then we'll have a brief at the end a plan of action of how to help menopausal women uh, a declaration that this is my entirely my own work it's very kindly paid for and sponsored by uh, my land, but they've had no input into the production whatsoever. Um, uh, my declarations, these are the various, uh, various affiliations. The fact is that I've done 45 years and counting in the NHS and I'm just about to finish now, so uh, I'm getting a bit fed up with it. But the primary uh, declaration, if I have to make one, was when I was a punk medical student 40 years ago, I saw the need for women's integrated women's sexual health. It wasn't happening for my women in Cambridge. They're having a very bad time. And I thought, how best to do it? Put it under one roof was the only sensible thing to do. And uh, I was probably right, because that's where a lot of people are doing it nowadays. So there we go. And for my sins, I'm also the uh, medical advisor to the Great Wall of Vagina. Uh, that's another lecture <laughs> some, other, some other time. So let's press on. This is my team in Western and the team that I left recently in Bristol. Um, both very good teams to be working with. Now, the reason I put this particular picture up here is that the principal concerns of, of menopausal and perimenopausal women relate to breast cancer risk. All the other things that can go wrong, things that go wrong with the brain, the heart, bones, uh, bowels, and you've just heard a lecture about bladder. All these things are enormously important, but the thing that most women are concerned about is, is breast cancer, and so we're going to focus quite substantially uh, on how the breast cancer risk, in fact, has been somewhat inflated, uh, and why actually there may be better, a better, better news for women about breast cancer and, and HRT. But the most important thing for, for, for you as doctors to know is that every tissue in your body, not just breast and genitals, is responsive to estrogen, has estrogen receptors in it, uh, they're estrogen dependent, and if you take away the estrogen, or even worse, if you fluctuate the, the amount of estrogen, then you change the response in the tissues, particularly noticeable in the brain if you fluctuate, and of course in all the tissues, uh, things get worse, uh, collagen is taken away, elastin is taken away, if you, once you actually go through menopause and you stop producing a natural human estrogen. So these are important, but the things that the most women are worried about is quite simply, is it safe? And so that's what we're going to be concentrating on when we look at our menopausal transition. And if we think of the menopausal transition, it's not just, uh, just, just the menopause itself. If we look here at this wonderful work by Cranach, the Jungbrunnen, the, uh, the, the uh, fountain of youth in the Gemalde Galerie in, in Berlin, uh, the women are, uh, of course, starting over here and coming the other side in, in real life, but in this fountain of youth, which in fact we could consider to be an estrogen effect. Uh, to take women, who, the old women, coming into the fountain and going out the other side. Wouldn't it be nice if you could rejuvenate a whole generation of women? Well, actually, that's a deadly serious point, because my generation of women, and I'm now 63, that generation was precisely the generation that got hit by the WHI scandal in 2002. So my generation, most of them, have not had the HRT that they should have had. 
uh, and that's going to produce huge problems in a few years' time. If any of you are into private practice and want to take up private uh, nursing care for women with osteoporotic fracture, this is the time to buy the big houses and nursing homes, okay? That's, that's a tip for the, for the future for those of you who are just in, in it for the money. So let's move on and think of this transition. We, we want to think of the whole sweep of women's health um, uh, because it doesn't just start at menopause, and this talk isn't really just about menopause, it's primarily about the bit in the middle, the early menopause or the perimenopause. Remember that the definitions, menopause happens on average between 47 and 56 with an average around 51, 52. Early menopause is counted as 40 to 46, and premature ovarian insufficiency, pr formerly premature ovarian failure, is counted from underneath the age of 40. So those are the areas that you most need to concentrate on in the menopausal area, in, 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 if you like, the perimenopausal vicinity. But the actual symptoms start much, much earlier. And the first uh, symptom of, 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 of cyclical uh, fluctuation of uh, symptom is, is mood and cognition of ability, um, bad moods, and also visuospatial coordination. Uh, and then, of course, you have the phase of the regular menses, which can go on for, for one or two years, can go on for five or ten years. And in fact, in some very lucky women, they have no problems and then suddenly stop. That's maybe only about 10% of the, of the population. The basal motor flushes are the things that really cause uh, them to, the, the women to present to you. Um, but maybe they'll pre have presented earlier with significant cyclical mood problems, which you might prescribe certain drugs that will probably cause anorgasmia, but we'll come to that later. So let's just think of the whole sweep of things, and we've also, also once again had an excellent talk on urogenital atrophy, for which you already know the solution, or one of the solutions anyway, uh, and there are other issues to consider, such as osteoporosis and dementia prevention. So that's what we're going to be considering in this lecture. So let's think of the prevalence of problems at the time of menopause, around the age of 50 to 55, and by, by overwhelming majority, it's night, uh, hot flushes and night sweats, and these are the things that cause the insomnia. And this is what causes the profound, uh, almost unrelenting tiredness, which also has psychoneuroendocrine endocrine effects on immunity as well. So it's that top bunch of, of symptoms that are, are the ones that really cause the global, if you like, uh, damage to women's health and inconvenience to women. Uh, but of course, in later, uh, later on in the menopause, the uh, uh, memory lapses, the joint muscle aches, the loss of libido, the vaginal dryness, and the atro general atrophy are the things that really matter. And the hot flushes will have mostly disappeared after an average about seven years. But some women are still having significant hot flushes out to 12 years post-menopause. And other women who've gone on to HRT and then been, uh, shall we say, artificially stopped by their GP after five years, which is a, quite a lot of women are told to do that, they suddenly get the vasomotor symptoms back again, and they need to be managed properly. So. Let's think of this perimenopausal area where, where rather than simply waiting till the woman's actually stopped having her periods, you're actually getting in there ahead of time and trying to ad address many of the earlier signs of, uh, of, ovarian, of impending ovarian failure. What you get is, is a fluctuation of estrogen level which causes a, a, almost like a roller coaster of symptoms, uh, mainly premenstrual syndrome and the physical symptoms associated with it. Uh, and for most women that starts in the 40s, uh, but there are some women who are, you know, early 30s will start to get this, and you have to recognize it rather than simply diagnosing them with depression and filling them up with, uh, filling them up with SSRIs, because SSRIs are certainly not a good treatment for, for PMS. So it's, it's caused by these unsta uh, unstable estradiol levels, which become more and more unstable as the ovary progressively fails. Um, and the, the trigger for women's, for the, for the uh, most important symptoms is a falling level of estrogen, which means that you get the maximal effect in the four or five days per, uh, pre-menstrually, but you also, in some women, depending on their sensitivity to it, get an effect in <coughs> just after uh, or around mid-cycle. Now, so you know that the, the PMS happens just before, uh, or, or in fact throughout the whole of the uh, throughout, throughout the whole of the luteal phase in some women who are progesterone sensitive. But the, the time when women are most stable is when their estrogen level, although low, is stable or rising. So this is the phase at which their mood tends to be uh, best, uh, and they are at their best. There are some women, of course, who are only at their best for about seven days in in any. Cycle. Some women do not magically get better when their period starts. It takes several days throughout the throughout the uh, the, 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 the period for the mood to, mood and other symptoms to return to normal. And some women will say that for only about a week or so that they feel like themselves. 
and other women will describe themselves at the rest of the time as almost like a Jekyll and Hyde or a, a, several women use the phrase psycho bitch from hell. Um, so <laughs> now it, is, it is actually rather difficult. If you're, a, if you're a, certainly, I know that most of the women, most people in the audience are women, there are some blokes, some male GP. So how does a male GP broach the subject of mood change with a woman who might well knock his head off if he gets it wrong. But the way I do it is to use a bit of comic understatement. I say, well, you know and I know there are some women who for just a few days before each period, well, they're slightly less than totally charming, kind, tolerant, patient, laid back, relaxed, etc., etc. That's the way I do it. Anyway, works for some, not for all. OK, now there's another thing to think of here, because most people used to think that the, that the culprit was progesterone. And if you look at the pattern of progesterone through the cycle, that actually fits quite well with quite a lot of women's problems and their, P and their PMS coming, as a, if you like, as a crescendo from mid-cycle. And for many years, it was thought that if you treated with progesterone, it would make a difference. And there is absolutely no, there's in fact a very good randomized control evidence that progesterone treatment makes not a jot of difference to premenstrual syndrome. So that is definitely off the menu and it has been for the last 15 or 20 years. So let's uh, progress then. So what the, the idea is to, to, to get better menopause care, you need to recognise the symptoms of the perimenopause and get on and treat it before they actually stop having their periods uh, so that you can ease the transition. Or as, as my, my, my beloved ex-wife, Annie Evans, who's, who taught me all I know about, uh, about menopause and without whom I wouldn't be standing here now, I still love her very dearly, but that's by the by. Um, uh, she, she would say that you would surf seamlessly through the menopause if you could actually treat the perimenopause properly. And I think that's a beautiful phrase and I've no, no, uh, no shame in repeating it. So let's have a look at the, the me mechanism by which this occurs. Remember the oestrogen affects all the various different tissues and if your oestrogen fluctuation or fall or subsequent loss, it, the first effect it has on in fact is serotonin and dopamine receptors which cause anger, which, which moderate anger and irritability. And what happens is that oestrogen affects uptake production and reuptake of serotonin. If you have a stable oestrogen level, doesn't, oestrogen level doesn't matter whether it's high or low, as long as it's stable, mood will be stable. If it rises, then the mood will stay stable as well. If it falls, then the mood changes and the mood becomes a lot worse. So it's falling oestrogen that makes the difference. And it makes the difference also with these other uh, aspects of cognition, visuospatial coordination, uh, panic attacks and palpitations, etc. Uh, of course, then later on, you get to the, 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 the main thing, once again, that women are presenting with is the hot flushes, the night sweats, and the, uh, the insomnia and immunity effects of all this. Uh, and then we go on for the pr pr prolonged problems. Interestingly, cartilage and ligament problems come in well before menopause. Uh, and in fact, most women in perimenopausal years with joint pains, that, that will be a premenstrual <coughs> phenomenon, uh, and it's treatable with oestrogen, uh, not with, uh, necessarily with anti-inflammatories. Um, and then eventually it goes to skin, bladder, vagina and bone, etc. And then we get, of course, the, car the carbohydrate metabolism effect, uh, the impaired glucose tolerance and the uh, increased risk of type 2 diabetes. You then get effects on endothelium. Remember that, of course, oestrogen is actually cardioprotective. Uh, and if you re remove oestrogen, you get, you get hypertension, atherosclerosis. And eventually you have an effect on declining cognition and dementia. So the oestrogen is jolly useful for women, and I, I commend it to you. So let's press on. Uh, this is, once again, that's the most important line to take, is that oestrogen primarily, uh, in terms of mood, primarily affects serotonin and dopamine. And that is the, that's the mechanism of action, and that's why oestrogen is important, very important, in the management of PMS. Okay, so yes, oh, that's one of the reasons also I'm much more interested in women's health than men's health. I mean, I'm, I do sexual health, so I do men as well, but women are so much more fascinating because there's so much more that can go wrong, so much more that needs adjusting, <laughs> whereas men are really rather straightforward, simple creatures. Uh, they, they need only a few things, uh, and, and, and of course they, they, they need a snooze button as well, as well, this is important. But this, what you demonstrate here is that, is that women have fluctuating oestrogen, uh, which causes a change in mood, and men uh, have a completely stable level of testosterone which is stable all their lives except very maybe maybe very gradually falls off so from one day to the next the testosterone level is absolutely the same so men have absolutely no excuse for being moody <laughs> right so another thing that's important once again this is still perimenopause and younger women even is to remember that different hormones affect different women differently and it is an individual genetically predetermined phenomenon that about maybe 20 or 30 percent of women put on the cheapest and most commonly prescribed pill which is a levonorgestrel pill and all the names are there 
will actually get androgenic mood side effects. So about 30% of women get moody either all the month uh, or maybe just premenstrually with, uh, with microgynon, etc. Uh, and the ones at the bottom of the list are less androgenic and have less mood side effects. Hardly a day goes by that I don't switch a woman from a levonorgestrel pill to a norgestimate pill. But of course the norgestimate pills have a slightly higher risk of, of, of less libido and once in a blue moon might I switch somebody from the, from the lower down the list to the ones at the top. Micro, uh, the levonorgestrel is closest structurally to testosterone so they might, it might have a benefit but it, once again it's each individual woman's genetically pre predetermined response to contraceptive hormones so what works for you may not work for your sister or for your best friend. And the only way you can be sure how a woman will react on a new pill or any, or any hormonal preparation is if you have already tried it out on their identical twin sister. Uh, you don't often have the opportunity to do that. So there we go. One more thing is that progesterone intolerance, particularly levonorgestrel intolerance, predicts subsequent P uh, PMS in the perimenopause. It's important. And it's genetically predetermined. It affects about three to, five percent, three to eight percent of women and this, uh, t this term, term now that's becoming much more widespread and much more much better known is levonorgestrel induced dysphoria. If you put these women in an MRI and give them levonorgestrel, their amygdala lights up differently to women who don't have problems with levonorgestrel. So it's actually a brain function phenomenon and it's genetic. Um, and once again, we said that levonorgestrel dysphoria predicts later premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Um, and also has a much, very much higher risk factor for, for postnatal depression. And that's all uh, been very well studied in Uppsala, but almost nowhere else. Uh, that's the reference. So the treatment for this, in fact, is transdermal estradiol, which is the most effective way of stabilizing the estrogen environment in the, in, in the patient. Uh, and SSRIs, SSRIs are not effect, effective. And in fact, the, the, I mean, how many of you, okay, here's a quick question, hands up. How many of you tell your patients that they might get, they might get, they have a 70% risk of anorgasmia if you put them on SSRIs? Not one of you. Well, the, the drug companies, the SSRI producing companies, have been very clever to hide that information because it is in the small print if you look carefully. And it's just one of those things that GPs never tell patients. I'm very glad that nobody put their hand up because it is interesting that there's the knowledge gap that goes on here. Anyway, never mind, let's move on. So here's a, here's a little bit of logic for you. If, you. if you have any physical or mental condition in a woman that has a precise, repeating, cyclical fluctuation, it must have a hormonal cause. Therefore, it could have a hormonal solution. Now, that has huge biological plausibility, but there are very few RCTs that actually look at this in some detail because of the difference, because of the difficulty of individual vari uh, genetic variability that defines the outcome. So here's a quick question. What is it that connects <laughs> asthma, opera, sports injury, and suicide? 30 seconds, turn to the person next to you and see if you can work out what connects all this lot. Of course, I'm going to give you a clue that it is something to do with this talk, actually. It doesn't seem like it, but it is. Well, let's see if we can give you, let's see if we can give you an answer here. It's an interesting fact of life that 25% of near-fatal asthma and fatal asthma admissions to hospital in women occur on the day of menstruation, 25%. Now, you don't have to be an immunologist or a chest physician to get interested in that. In fact, anybody should be interested in that. It shows you how massively your hormonal environment alters your immunity. And in fact, a good 75% of all asthma attacks in women uh, are exacerbated in the luteal phase and occur in the week before menstruation. That's interesting. You also know that epilepsy is altered by menstruation itself. Um, but the, there's something else that's actually quite important is that arthritis and sciatica are much more likely to hit just before, maybe in the last week of the cycle. Uh, and that's an effect on cartilage. Now you all know the effect that high estrogen levels have on cartilage in pregnancy. They cause the symphysis pubis to be much more flexible and also they cause the intercostal muscles to expand, gives you one third increased uh, uh, expiratory volume. In your, uh, so you have huge respiratory changes uh, in uh, obstetric physiology, but that's, that's not quite relevant here. What's much more relevant is that when you take the estrogen away, you cause really se severe joint discomfort and, and technical problems. So the sports injury, uh, injury problem is that women, women athletes are five to eight times more likely to have anterior cruciate ligament fracture or rupture than male athletes. 
and nearly all of the fractures and ruptures occur on the, around the day of menstruation or around mid-cycle. Those are the times when oestrogen is falling, so your, your uh, tissues, your, your ligaments, which were reasonably lax thanks to high oestrogen levels, suddenly become tense, and then they're suddenly more prone to fracture. So that's actually quite important. So that's a fairly major problem. We've got death from asthma, we've got ACL fracture. What about, what about minimal symptoms? Where does opera come into this? Well, I happen to know this because one of my patients is actually a voice coach, and she tells me that many opera singers have it written, pre-menopausal pre opera singers, have it written into their contract that they don't have to perform in the week before their period. Now, why is that? That's an effect of oestrogen on the, on the cartilage of the larynx. What it actually does is you lose half an octave from the top of the scale if you're a soprano. Now, that's not very important to most of the people in this audience. Mind you, it's an Islington audience, so maybe you're interested in opera, I don't know. <laughs> but the fact is that what I'm showing you here is we've gone from something, you know, death from asthma to losing a little bit off the top of your voice. And the reason I'm showing you these two extremes is that oestrogen does those two uh, lack of oestrogen or falling oestrogen level does both of those and everything in between. So there is an enormous range of symptoms that oestrogen uh, has an effect on. One of which, of course, is this one here, which is clumsiness, lack of visuospatial uh, abilities. And many women will tell, tell me that for just a day or two before their period, perfectly good drivers, for a day or two before their period, you can see what's coming next, they can't reverse park. Women are much, statistically, just ask any insurance company, women are much, statistically much more likely to have a low-speed manoeuvring accident in the day or two before their period. Think about it. Interesting. Okay. Also, for any of the dermatologists here, of course, if you were dermatologists, you'd, you'd be in the other room, but all these conditions get worse just before the period. And interest, it's very interesting to, to, to see that you can actually ablate recurrences, for instance, of Bechet's syndrome and of herpes by giving by giving estradiol in the, in the luteal phase of the cycle, but there's almost no dermatologist knows about this or uses that, uses that technique. But if you ablate the cycle, all of these conditions get better or do not recur uh, premenstrually. So if you think of all the symptoms that you add up together, you're getting pretty fed up by now. Uh, if you have, and most women have a, a very sizable proportion of these symptoms, and once again, we're just highlighting the, the, uh, the arthritis uh, symptoms. You put it all together and you think, oh my goodness, what is going on? Have you had enough symptoms? You know, and also, even worse, your, your GP diagnoses that you are depressed, which is not unreasonable under the circumstances, and you think, am I going completely stark staring mad? Uh, uh, and, uh, and well, Maybe, maybe, maybe she is, but anyway, there we go, that's not, neither here nor there, it's unfair. Let's now come back very, we're, we're just about to finish with the perimenopause, because it's about time we got onto menopause, but you can see that there's a, because there's a continuum, I want to keep it real, so that this is something interesting, a fantastic study in India for premenstrual dysphoric disorder in medical students. So it doesn't, you know, these are medical students in their, in their, in their 20s, for goodness sake, uh, and one of the major fact, factors here, body ache and joint pain, a third of them, Get joint pains. So that's a very important fa factor, but perhaps the best study is the Seattle Women's Mid uh, Midlife Women's Study, which 500 women followed for up to 20, 23 years, finally reported in 2015 on, uh, on, on data in two, from 2013. This is an earlier uh, presentation. Looking at the, the four <laughs> principal patterns of women with perimenopausal symptoms. They, they, these are, they've, they've all got PMS, they've got, all got mood problems, but these are the physical symptoms that they presented with in addition to their mood alteration. And so you can see the top one is joint ache uh, being the top one and all the other symptoms minor. And let's just look at the prevalence of this. So good two thirds of them, joint ache is the primary physical presenting symptom and you can read the rest of those together. And it's interesting the hot flushes and all the rest. Uh, the hot flushes are in there quite, quite a bit. It's flashes of course because it's American presentation, but there we go. So, joint ache, very, very important thing to watch out for. And once again, don't just be d dispensing your, um, uh, your anti-inflammatories if the joint ache is, p is, is perfectly cyclically uh, timed. Okay, so now we come to a case scenario that presented to me, but I'll try and present it to you. And when we have the question marks, I want you once again to turn to the person next to you to answer the question. So here's a 35-year-old teacher whose period pains were worse when she had an IUD fitted. She had to come off the pill because she had migraine with aura, not an uncommon phenomenon. So she had an IUD put in, her period pains got worse. Uh, she has a long-term history in, uh, as, a, as a school kid of time off school with severe period pains and hot water bottle as well, HWB positive, uh, and a mother and sister ditto. So turn to the person next to you, what is her diagnosis? 
obvious diagnosis, classic features of, of, anyone want to say it? Endometriosis, thank you very much, obvious, blatantly obvious. If you, 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 that, that absolutely defines endometriosis. And if they have menstrual dyskesia, defecation pain uh, at the time of menstruation, that is pathognomonic of deep infiltrating endometriosis. And it's one of those symptoms that you guys should all know about and not think that they've just got PID. So what about the next lot of symptoms? She's got increasing mood problems and joint pains over the previous three years. Uh, and then it seems to get much worse in the last six months, which is a very common phenomenon. Some women can actually say they can almost point it out to one month where suddenly everything got worse. In other women, it's a gradual transition. But anyway, hers got worse six months ago. And she was given by the GP, not unreasonably, citalopram, nitrosapam, and ibuprofen. And armed with these three drugs, she makes, oh yeah, sorry, by the way, what's the diagnosis there, by the way? Before? It's, perimenopause. It's peri the diagnosis is perimenopausal, uh, a per perimenopausal PMS or premenstrual dysphoric disorder. So that's the, dis the, the, uh, uh, the diagnosis. And on with the three drugs, she makes three suicide attempts on the day before each of the previous three periods. And then comes to see me, or let's say comes to see you. So here's the question. You see this patient two days before her. Wait, 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 can we go back just because it's e e easier to show this for just a second. So you, you see her two days before her next period. Are you going to increase the dose of citalopram, switch to another SSRI, refer immediately to a community psychiatrist, phone a friend, none of the above or something completely different. And now off to the Slido and answer the questions now, please. I'm not quite sure how, how many people, only seven people have answered. Come on, you can do better than that. <laughs> Maybe you weren't ready with your phones and things like that. We're getting a few more, 17 people, 23. Um, when we get to 30, can we, are we okay, well, let's, uh, are we all 35? Okay, 39, right. 45, well, that's, uh, 45 is probably enough, isn't it, 46? Okay, that's about it. Let's stop it, let's cut it there, 49. And none of the above and something completely different. Well, that's very nice, actually. And so quite a few would refer to community psychiatry. Uh, certainly, some interesting, some people would switch to another SSRI. Fascinating. I think, for, uh, yes, and nobody in the world would increase the dose of citalopram. Good, I'm glad about that. Uh, I'd be interested to know which other SSRI you think would make this person's problem better. But well, that's by the by. Uh, so something completely different. And it might be interesting you, if, you, if we had time, but we don't, for you to have had that discussion amongst yourselves as to what you would actually do. Um, let's move on and uh, we'll, we'll show, see what actually happened. Well, if we think of the, the problem that this woman has, she has pre premenstrual syndrome and not bipolar disorder. Uh, and these have many symptoms in common. And they need a correct diagnosis, and this is particularly important around the time of menopause. And PMS, once again, PMS history comes from the cyclicity of the symptoms and improvement when they get pregnant and, and uh, a greater risk of postpartum depression. The final punchline here from John Studd, women with severe PMS do not respond to the antidepressants and mood drug stabilising drugs uh, typically given for bipolar disorder. So we're going to do something completely different. What we do is we give her a, a symptom score chart as the first thing, and this is the symptom score chart that I produced based on an American uh, chart, but also we're looking at a lot of physical symptoms that you could add in as well. And this is her actual chart showing what happened during her first period. And these are the various uh, symptoms that she had, the mood symptoms, seven of them, and then, then three uh, physical symptoms at the bottom. And if we actually, actually add up the score, what, actually happened, what we did was we stopped all her drugs. We took all the drugs away from her, we fitted an IUS straight away and we gave her estradiol gel one milligram per day as the management of her severe PMS two days before her period. And what actually happened was that though she had suicide, she had a mental score of 33 out of 35 because there are five, seven domains, each scoring five, but she had suicidal ideation but did not make a suicide attempt. Now, whether that was just because we'd taken all, taken all her pills away, I don't actually know. <laughs> but anyway, over time, over the next few months, things uh, evolved. And the first thing that happened was she forgot to take the, tab, the, the gel, the transdermal gel, for two days, and look what happened to her mood score over two days of not taking estrogen. Interesting effect of when you stop estrogen in women uh, who are dependent upon it. Here's the next period with a score of 27. 
then, he, then we decided to reduce to the standard pre-menopausal dose of 0.5 milligrams a day. Uh, we also got a mood change, scoring 15. And then in her next period, we'd simply take having an IUS in place uh, and transdermal estrogen, uh, her score was two. And we handed her back to the GP in, uh, within 10 weeks. Um, well, with, with her problems largely sorted out. So basically, her period pains got better than Mirena, her, mo her mood got better almost immediately with uh, east transdermal estrogen, no further suicide attempts, uh, the joint pains got better miraculously as well, um, and she had one prescription instead of three, um, uh, and the only question that we're left with is she's now on HRT at the age of 35, do we need to do anything else? Well, you monitor her, you follow her, and when she starts to get, because she's on a low dose, when you, she starts to get mood, when she starts to get uh, vasomotor symptoms, you increase to the menopausal dose of two milligrams a day, and then perhaps back off from there. Or we'll start or go up to one or one point five, and, and titrate the dose to, to her symptoms. So management of the perimenopause. You have to under, if you want, if you want to understand menopause, then you need to understand perimenopause. And the the, effort, the faculty guidelines are well worth a read on this. So you manage it as a continuum, not saying, oh yes, it's just menopause or it's just perimenopause. It's one and the same thing. So but basically, you can just tell the the transition is that in, when they get to menopause, they have the same and worse symptoms with an amenorrhea and their cyclicity ceases. If they're already, the great thing is, of course, if they're already on an IUS, then you simply increase, or they've had a hysterectomy, increase the, uh, the symptoms of what, uh, the, the treatment and begin HRT before they get to menopause if you want them to surf seamlessly through. Okay, so risks of diagnosis for premature ovarian insufficiency, um, menopause under age 40. It's actually very rare. It's only one in 100, but that is very significant, Kate, very significant for those women. Um, and under 30, it's one in 1,000. Um, and then it's one in, uh, under 20, it's one in 10,000. And there are, there's primary, his, primary with a family history of chromosome or autoimmune or enzyme deficiencies. And there's secondary from chemo, obviously, self-injectomy, uh, infection, TB can do it, interestingly. And also post-hysterectomy post -hysterectomy with uh, ovarian preservation, the, uh, the half of the blood supply to the ovaries comes from, uh, from the uterus, and so they tend to, to, to fail about four years before they would otherwise have done. So they're at much higher risk of osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease, and earlier dementia, so you need to get them onto treatment quicker, and in fact, that should be... Uh, refer to specialist and you diagnose it by using two FSH levels more than uh, four, more than four weeks apart and you refer to a specialist. No, you can't just diagnose on one level, it has to be two, but that's the only time in which you really need to use uh, an FSH level. You don't need to use it after the age of 45. So you all know about, uh, about the, the, the dangers of HRT which were massively overplayed. Notice that the pages here are not the front page. These are all the stories that came only two years later to show that things had been wrongly done. Uh, uh, and that we've had, once again, my generation of women affected massively, uh, un needlessly, from, from bad science and bad press reporting. So here's the next question coming up. D d wait, for the, wait for it. I'm going to just uh, look at these things. There's, there's four, five stems here. So, which, uh, so one stem and five, five possible answers. Which of the, one of these, only one of these statements is true for menopausal women starting Combined estradiol and progesterone HRT under age 60 compared to women not taking any treatment. Risk of cardiac event minimally increased. Risk of dying from cardiac event is not significantly altered. 10-year risk of dying from breast cancer is significantly reduced. Risk of bowel cancer marginally increased. 10-year risk of major, major osteoporotic fracture is marginally decreased. Answer now, please, with the Slido. Let's uh, change it over and see wh where we get to. 10 minutes. Oh, dear. Right, OK. So, see what you think about that. We've got a few, two answers in all, very ginger, ginger about this. Thirteen answers, seventeen answers. We'll go for another, another fifteen oh. seconds and then give you a chance to, to get in there. Thirty. Okay, fifty-one, that, that'll do now. Let's have a look and see what the answers are. Uh, so, risk of dying from a cardiac event is, is not significantly altered. Now, that's what the NICE guidelines actually say, but it's not true, which is very interesting. And I'll show you, I'll show you the statistics uh, later. Well, you, you're quite, you guys were quite right to, to, to say that. Um, risk of uh, uh, osteoporotic fracture is marginally de decreased. Uh, that's, no, it's very substantially decreased at 10 years. 
Um, risk of, um, where are we? Here we are. Risk of having a cardiac event is minimally increased. Absolutely not. It's substantially decreased. Uh, risk of bowel cancer, of course, is actually decreased. The correct answer is the one here. Ten-year risk of dying from breast cancer is significantly reduced, which is exactly the opposite to what you expected and what your patients would expect. And I will demonstrate that to you in just a moment. So, interesting or what? Next, please. Let's go, let's go on. So, what we knew before 2002, let's, uh, we knew for a start that all-cause mortality is significantly lower in women taking HRT than not taking HRT. That is, if you like, the bottom line. Uh, and it doesn't really matter what the different causes were. But we also know it prevents osteoporosis and heart disease, reduces bowel cancer, and you get a better quality of life. Uh, and there's pr uh, certainly what it was known in those days that improved cognition was an effect of uh, oestrogen, uh, of HRT, but it wasn't known whether it would actually prevent Alzheimer's, and that has changed recently. So, what about oestrogen cardioprotection? Your heart attack risk is very different in men and women up to the age of menopause. Uh, men have much higher risk because they don't have very much oestrogen on board. Oestrogen is cardioprotective, and then when you lose oestrogen, your risk goes up at the same rate uh, as men post-menopause if you don't take HRT, but if you do take HRT, it is very substantially protected if you start HRT around the time of menopause, uh, because it prevents atheroma, reduces arrhythmias, and it improves lipid profile and carbohydrate metabolism as well. So if we actually look at the classic study here, this is the, this is the best quality RCT evidence that we've got. 11 years of, of, of HRT versus placebo, a substantial difference in mortality. This is actually admission to hospital or dying from heart failure or myocardial infarction. Then, thanks to the WHI study, which we'll talk about in a moment, the, study was, the, the treatment was stopped at 11 years, and you can see that there is an increased rate of heart attack, of heart attack uh, or hos hospital admission or death um, in the women who were taken off the HRT because they had to be, they, the treatment had to be stopped. And when you stop HRT in women who have got, the, have got HRT cardioprotection, they lose HRT cardioprotection and their, and their risk of dying from heart disease goes up. That's not at all surprising. It's the opposite of what, once again, of what you've been told, but it's not surprising. So, so acronyms, you already know, premature ovarian insufficiency, now not premature ovarian failure. MHT, which we haven't mentioned yet, is the new name for HRT, menopausal hormone therapy, meant to, meant to, to emphasise the fact that you treat the menopause when they become menopausal, not waiting 10, 15 or 20 years to suddenly hit them with a drug that we would never use in this country anyway, which of course is what the Women's Health Initiative actually did. It's been the principal source of misinformation about HRT, and they assess the risk and benefits of starting on starting late, late starting 10 or 20 years postmenopausal uh, oral HRT um, uh, in women who were too old, too fat, and too ill to, to, to warrant it anyway. And it was only on a promise of free Medicare, which I understand is quite important in the states. Uh, and it was, and the results were inappropriately extrapolated to all other HRT preparations in all women, uh, which was utterly inappropriate. Uh, the Million Women study really is, is largely has no assessment of dose preparation timing. It's not a robust study at all. And although not, there are some epidemiologists, principally the ones in Oxford, who, 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 who actually you know who live it and breathe it, pretty well every menopause expert in the world disregards it and rather ridicules it in fact. We have NICE and the bottom line, which you've actually lost at, off the bottom there, the NICE guidance pretty well redresses most of the inaccuracies of the previous 15 years or so, but it rather underestimates the risk, the benefits, the cardiovascular benefits of HRT. So you've seen all these, uh, these studies. So uh, the Women's Health Initiative showed that there were seven more heart attacks in, in, in women. Look at that. Why would you give a 79-year-old suddenly give her HRT? Absolutely no indication of that at all, uh, unless she had it stopped by her GP at the age of, of 78, which I've done in, in, uh, in the past. So there's seven extra heart attacks. Uh, and so that was 30 in the placebo group versus 37. That's a 29% increase if you just look at that figure. And that's what the Daily Mail took and blew up everywhere. Whereas, in fact, it's out of 10,000 women. So it's actually an absolute risk of 0.7. And if you look at the stuff at the bottom, yes, I'm going to be, I am going to be winding up very, very quickly. Sorry. Yeah. Um, is that, in fact, it showed that the breast cancer risk was less. There's, uh, there's seven less breast cancers if you're on estrogen-only replacement therapy. And that was never... If we wanted to media spin that, nobody bothered to take this and media spin it that there was a 23% less risk 
of, of, of breast cancer if you were on H uh, estrogen only HRT. Now, once again, that's not quite true because the figure, the, the, the absolute risk is much less than that, but it is a, redu is a reduced risk. So the, the reassessment shows that there were significantly less heart attack, heart disease events in women under 60, no significant difference in breast cancer, and less breast cancer in the estrogen only HRT, and that the progesterone dose, it meant that progesterone is probably important. Uh, this is actually a very, very serious stuff, that the, the, the progesterone type you use is important. And here's some, uh, some risk information about breast cancer. You're much less likely to have it spread to the axilla, less, less likely to spread beyond the axilla, uh, and also you get smaller tumours, less aggressive histology, better all your age survival. This is the critically, critically important finding, which was known before WHI, that if you're on HRT at the time of diagnosis, you are much more likely to survive 10 years than if you're not on it. And that's the classic take home message here that actually HRT protects you in some ways against breast cancer, or so protects you against death from breast cancer, gives you a much better prognosis. And as Dr. Michael Caine would say, not a lot of people know that. <laughs> so let's press on. So here's, here's, for, here's for estrogen and progesterone, HRT, a risk benefit analysis. We know there's less uh, bowel cancer deaths, less cardiac, there are 11 less cardiac deaths. You know, would you rather get a breast cancer, uh, have a minimal increased risk of breast cancer, or would you rather not die of a heart attack? No, which would you, which would you want? And the, unfortunately, there's, there's just not enough room here, too many to show. That should be right down the bottom of the scale there. So let's just move on from that. We're now way out of time, and this is, I was going to be talking about the, the actual risk, but this is the breast cancer risk, 45 versus 47, from the original paper. And it's an odds ratio of 1.14, which is very, very small. A real odds ratio, if you're interested in a real odds ratio, something that really tells you that something's valuable, then you want an odds ratio, of the, the best odds ratio you can get is 40 for smoking and lung cancer. And interestingly, of course, uh, if you stop women smoking, that substantially reduces uh, their risk of dying. Uh, and that's probably more important than anything you can tell them about HRT and breast cancer. So. Uh, actually, I'll leave the quote uh, out because we haven't got time to deal with it. So it's a, it's a, if it's of an effect at all, it's a small effect, or in fact, it's actually, when we think about the long-term survival, it's actually fake news. And you guys need to be able to, 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 to combat that fake news. Now, I'm going to go just a couple of minutes over, uh, but not very much over. Uh, so we'll just do the calculation. If you have 45 women who are not on HRT, they have a 36% risk of dying in 10 years, so that means 16 deaths. 47 women with a 20% risk of dying at 10 years, that means nine deaths. So that's seven less deaths from, uh, from HRT, breast cancer deaths from combined HRT. So a first degree relative doubles your risk, but it doesn't matter whether you take HRT or not. Likewise, a second degree uh, relative doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you take HRT or not. Your risk is higher. Uh, but it doesn't, it, uh, HRT doesn't make any difference. So what else do we now know about the benefits of HRT? We, know, we knew all this stuff before. What e extra can we add? And I haven't had no time to show you this. We now have reasonably good evidence that it reduces and uh, prevents Alzheimer's disease. And we now know that it reduces breast cancer if you take estrogen replacement therapy only. And that is new news since 2002. That's all that's really new, other than the fact that you've been previously given the wrong advice. So let's have a plan of action, and we're going to have to rush through this very quickly because, in fact, there's some very interesting, read the NICE guidelines because it's all, it's nearly all there, although some of the emphasis isn't quite as, as one might want to put it, which is not as, as enthusiastic about cardiac protection. Uh, I'm not quite sure why because, once again, the RCTs are there uh, and they're well worth, uh, worth looking at. Uh, but you assess the ri individual risk and you think about the se severity of the symptoms affecting all aspects of the woman's life. And, you, and in fact, one of the best things you can do is probably to choose transdermal over, uh, uh, over uh, oral. Uh, for most patients, interestingly, though, very specifically for those with a high BMI or VTE history or breast cancer family history, migraine, um, uh, those are the things that you need to think seriously about, transdermals. Uh, and minimise the progesterone. I'm going to talk about progesterone differences in a moment. You do your basic health check. You don't need to do hormone levels. And you choose the most appropriate method together with your patient. It's not, you know, you're not saying, you're going to take this, you're going to take that. Give them the options. Send them away. To, to, uh, give them the websites that we've got and the resources at the end. But read the guidelines. And the guidelines tell you this. And in fact, the most important bit about the guidelines is this going on the symptoms. You assess the individual need. Don't do laboratory tests, just go on how bad the woman's symptoms are and how much she wants them relieved. 
So to discuss the risk and benefit and just give them, or just rather offer them, HRT and give them the information to take away to make their own decision. They'll come back to you. Don't expect to do it all in one uh, single consultation, but give them the information and they will, uh, they will follow the advice. Transdermal, once again, much better for VT, high VTE risk. And once again, they, in fact, the NICE guidelines say, do not routinely give antidepressants, SSRIs, unless the patient has formal, uh, formally diagnosed depression. Uh, isoflavones is apparently in black cohort safety uncertain, but they may be useful for people who don't want to take HRT. And all, we've already heard an excellent talk about how useful vaginal estrogen is. Review it three months and thereafter. I'm not going to read any of these other bits other than to say this is the Menopause Society, which is the International Menopause Society. Um, uh, and they're, basically, their the punchline here is the benefits of HRT are many and the risks are few. But another thing that they found is that the breast cancer risks are low with micronized progesterone, which is actual uh, physiological progesterone, or diadrogesterone, uh, diadrogesterone than any other synthetic progesterone. And here's the evidence. This is a big study done uh, from the Finnish National C Cancer Cohort Study, looking at breast cancer risk uh, on, first of all, on no treatment at all, on estrogen with digestrone, with MPA, and with norethisterone. Why would you choose a norethisterone or an LNG product if you could use digestrone, um, which I, I would strongly recommend to you, or in fact, micronized progesterone. And it's interesting, actually, another thing is that for goodness sake, if you've got a woman who's had problems with mood on a levonorgestrel pill, do not give them a levonorgestrel containing HRT. And likewise, if they've had a norethisterone pill problem, uh, contraceptive pill problem, don't give them norethisterone in their preparation. But just for comparison, if you give them estrogen only therapy, this is their, the WHI finding is that their risk of breast cancer is significantly lower. So that's another very good reason to consider estrogen only therapy for those in, of course, who, who you can give it. So just to finish off, uh, looking at the uh, specific HR, systemic HRT RT treatments, uh, we, if you've got a hysterectomy or marina in situ, then estrogen only, you have a choice between oral transdermal, uh, and these, the, all this information is on the BMS, British Menopause Society website, and you can use estradiol or conjugated estrogen. I, I don't really understand why people want to use conjugated estrogens now, the uh, equine estrogen. You've been using bovine, when did you last use bovine and porcine insulin? Years ago, people use human insulin as a why not use 17 beta estradiol, human uh, body identical uh, estradiol. Don't go for the so called bio identical products which are custom compounded and could have any amount of rubbish in them and no do with no dose regulation whatsoever. So, if you have to go for estrogen and progesterone, if they are perimenopausal, you go for sequential therapy for a year. Um, uh, and that's just for the first year. And then you can switch. If they are postmenopausal by 12 months or more, then you can go straight to continuous combined. But of course, you may already have them on, conti uh, on a continuous combined preparation, if you like. Uh, if you've got them with an IUS and transdermal estrogen, you've got them in the perimenopause. They're already on that. They can just continue that uh, uh, ad infinitum. So once again, estrogen only, well, well, tremendous benefit from stabilizing the estrogen level, no first pass metabolism, and absolutely the first choice for people with a high BMI. Uh, that's very important. Uh, hopefully this, this will be, the PDF for this will be on the website. I'm not quite sure whether you're going to be able to put it up. Um, maybe. maybe, maybe. Okay, we now, we now have got to wind up. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to finish, uh, finish on this. Um, that once again there's a choice of progesterone don't give uh, lng or net um uh, and uh, you have less breast cancer there i think we just got to finish off there were several other slides but i have i apologize tremendously for having overrun here and i apologize also to the next speaker but i'm going to get off pretty well straight away there are other concerns um but yes this is the fight the fi actually i'm going to use this as my final slide is that there are going to be circumstances where most people would say it's not appropriate to give HRT, but in fact, in all of these conditions, and I, I strongly recommend this particular paper to almost anybody, all these conditions you can use uh, HRT if the potential risk is understood and if HRT is effective in symptom control. And here's a lovely punchline. If the quality of remaining life is paramount. Now, the quality of most women's remaining life is paramount, and I shall leave you with that thought. Thank you very much, and apologies once again for overrunning. Sorry, Jane. Follow that. Thank you, thank you so much, Peter. It's, it's so all entertaining as ever.
We, we, uh, you've virtually broken Slido because we've had so many questions in. Unfortunately, we haven't got time now. Uh, lunch, I'll be around. I'm around okay. at lunch for food. So Chris is around at, at lunchtime, and, and if if he's gone, I I can help with some of the questions.